that at the cross, where Christ bore our sins, and that by our faith, our burden of sin was rolled away. You rose from that tomb, you rolled the stone away, and you gave victory. We have that victory in Jesus. And for this, Lord, we come today and praise you with gladness and thanksgiving. What a mighty God you are. Lord, as we come and we continue in worship, as we come and we open your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, Lord, that it would be your message for the people today. That, Lord, you would give me that boldness and clarity, and, Lord, that your message, your truth, would go forth. And, Lord, that we would hear it, We would continue for those that know Christ to be transformed by the renewing of our mind as we hear your word today and as we continue and lead this day to go forth and to praise you for being a mighty God and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we thank you for what you have done already this morning what you have done in this church for so many years and what you are doing and will do. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. We need to praise the Lord. Praise God. You know, my parents, I've said it before, I was raised in a Christian home, and my parents loved the Lord. I'm thankful for that. And they knew how to praise God, praise the Lord in many different situations. And I still remember one time very distinctly, I was a teenager, and I was at home, and my dad was doing something. I cannot remember exactly what it was, but it was in the kitchen area, and he dropped a dish or something fell over or spilled something or whatever. And I remember him saying, praise the Lord. And I was like, okay, that's kind of odd. But my parents would do that and my dad specifically. I remember many occasions. He wasn't using the Lord's name in vain. It wasn't blasphemous. It was, he was praising God in any and every situation. It was like, and my dad was just a very optimistic man, and he would look at things in a positive way. He was a realist. He would look at things in reality and tell it the way it was, but he was, he was positive. And he would look at things, and he, in that situation and in other situations, it was, we could cry over it, I could get mad, I could say words that are not appropriate, or I could say, praise the Lord. And he praised God. And he said, praise the Lord. Do we praise God at all times and in all situations? Do we praise God with gladness and thanksgiving? Nehemiah and the Israelites, they had built the wall, they had hung the gates, and they read the word of God. We've been studying for several weeks in the book of Nehemiah, if you are new with us. And we have seen so much happen in Nehemiah, and it's now we're nearing the end of the book. 
And there's a lot happening here, even at the end of the book of Nehemiah. But today I want to look at one particular verse, and then we'll go back and look at a little more of the passage. But I want to look at Nehemiah 12. We're going to look at the last section of this section of 12, uh, 27 through 43. And it's talking about a time when Nehemiah was dedicating the walls in a celebration. And I told you several weeks ago that there would be a time of celebration. And here it is. But I want to look at verse 43 specifically to start. And so Nehemiah 12, verse 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced. And the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. The Israelites praised God because he is God. And God gave them joy, and their joy was so loud and boisterous that it was heard far away to the Gentiles. Nehemiah saw a problem. The walls were broken down. There were burned gates in the city of Jerusalem. He was in exile and needed to return to Jerusalem to build the walls. By God's mighty hand, the king granted Nehemiah's request to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. In our study, we've seen the Israelites work together in unity to build the wall. Building with trowel in one hand and weapon in the other hand, they built. Chapter 2 ends with Nehemiah saying, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we, his servants, will arise and build. And the people saying in response, let us rise up and build. And then in chapter 3, it gives us this beautiful picture of the people building side by side. It's various groups of people, nobles and priests and commoners, building the wall next to each other. And it actually says next to them and next to them, and then it says and after them and after them and after them. There are these different groups and individuals building together to build the wall. They had a common unity to work together to build the walls. And while they were building the wall, they were also building bridges of connection to one another. We have seen physical building and renovation in our church while we have also been building up spiritual walls of faith. As we have been searching for a lead pastor, we have continued building and strengthening our ministry. During this time, it has been transition, change, and even at times, struggle. But, just like Nehemiah, he said, God will do it. We are trusting God to continue to move us forward in ministry. And unless the Lord returns, we're trusting that he will build us in ministry for another 75 years and more. And doing this, we're building, and we should be building a bridge of unity to one another and seeking the best for each person in our congregation. The Israelites, they had these various groups of people and different types of workers that came together to build the wall. We have here people, especially in Florida, in this part of Florida, people from all walks of life, from different parts of the country. And they come together in community that we call Calvary Baptist Church. Do you know what community is? Well, lots of definitions. But it's a group of people that have a common unity. Our common ground is what we just sang about, at the cross, at the cross. Our common ground is at the foot of the cross. Our common ground is faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and standing on the promises of God. 
In this common ground, we have unity. We need to remember this as we continue to build up the wall spiritually on the foundation of Jesus Christ. We need to build together in common unity. And as God does the spiritual building of common unity and faith, we need to praise him and celebrate and praise God with gladness and thanksgiving. For Nehemiah and the Israelites, the wall is built, the gates are hung, and it's time to celebrate. When God does a mighty work, we should celebrate and praise God with gladness and thanksgiving. Today, as we look at Nehemiah and how they celebrated, I really want it to be as we think about our lives individually, as we think about our marriages, as we think about our families, as we think about our church, that we would praise God. It's a celebration. If we look at our church and look at this church that's here, it's been around for many years. And there's ministry that's continuing, as was shared earlier. We continue to see God work, and we should celebrate. And so Nehemiah realizes there needs to be for his people a dedication of the walls, a celebration. And so we look back up into verse 27 of Nehemiah 12. And it says, And at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, with thanksgivings, and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. As we have seen so many times, Nehemiah, he's an excellent leader. He's an organizer and a planner. And he even plans out this dedication and celebration. He organizes two choirs. One will be led by Ezra, the other by Nehemiah. But before they march on the walls, the Levites purify themselves in the gates, as we see in verse 30. And the priests and Levites purified themselves, and they purified the wall and the gates. I'm sorry, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. They needed to make it pure. Nehemiah then, he says, he brings up the two choirs up onto the wall. Verse 31, then I brought the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs and gave thanks. They march in opposite directions around the wall. This is a celebration. This is a, an exciting time. They've built the wall. And now they're going to march around as verse 40 says, so both choirs of those who gave thanks, they, they marched around the wall and then they came together in the house of God. And then in verse 43, we see they made great sacrifices and they rejoiced. They had built the wall. They had dedicated themselves to, as Ezra read from the book of the law, and they confessed their sins. They repented and they made a covenant with God. Now... They dedicate the wall and praise God with gladness and thanksgiving. If you can picture this, what is happening is they've had their time. They've built the wall. They've hung the gates. They're now in the city. And back in Nehemiah 7, it said that there were, when they built the wall, uh, the city was few. There was few people there. It was empty. And now Nehemiah has gone and he's worked. And as we read through these chapters up to here, and as we've said, we're kind of doing an overview and you can go back and read on your own. But we see in 11, chapter 11 and in 7, there's a groups of people that are numbered and counted. And what is happening is Nehemiah is working to repopulate the city. And he now has people in the city, but there are certain Levites that are in the city. But then it says in verse 27 that he goes and gets all these Levites, he brings them in, Levites as the priests, and he brings in singers from surrounding villages, and he builds these choirs. And they go and they get up on the wall. They're going to walk around the wall that they just built. And if you could picture it, it says one group going one way and one group going another way, and they're walking around to meet at the temple, the house of God. And it doesn't clearly say, but most believe they're singing and they're, they're, as they start out, they're singing. And they're singing as they continue and they're singing when they get together. 
They're praising God. And they're thankful for what God has done for them. So let me ask you, why do we praise God? Why do you praise God? Do we praise God for our benefit? Do we praise God because it makes us feel good? Do we praise God because we like to sing? They were singing. You know, we should praise God. We praise God because he is God. We praise God because he is God. God is God. God is sovereign, mighty, powerful, all-knowing. He has the answers, and he is the one working and who has done great and mighty things. He never changes and is always faithful in steadfast love. And he is the one that built the walls and hung the gates in Jerusalem. Nehemiah said from the beginning it was God that gave him favor to be released from the king and bring him to Jerusalem. It was God who worked in the people to build the wall. It was God who would keep them safe from the enemy. It was God who would guide and direct them from the book of the law. And it was God who should now be praised and glorified. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, we've read how Nehemiah continually prayed and looked to God for guidance. He looked to him to answer. He looked to him to do a mighty work. We read a couple weeks ago and we said together the verse, Nehemiah 4, 14. I don't know about you, but I keep remembering it. I keep thinking about it. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Nehemiah 4.14. Nehemiah continually remembered God and now praised God because he is God. Do you praise God with gladness and thanksgiving just because he is a great and awesome God? You may know God. You may know his word. You may be here each Sunday in the worship service. But do you praise God because he is God? Let me tell you what I mean by that. Many of us, we want to get the good report. We want to get the good job. We want to get the financial break. And when we get those then we praise God. You know, two years ago, at this time in July, two years ago, I had a big knot right over here above my collarbone. And I had had a scan of it and was told it was a lymph node, and your lymph nodes aren't supposed to be swollen like that, and there's something wrong. And so then it was another month, six weeks of test and waiting, had surgery, and then I found out it was that word we don't like to hear. And it's cancer. Now as cancer goes, I guess cancer's never good, but if it's going to be, it wasn't as bad as it could be, but it was thyroid cancer. And because it was already in a lymph node, instead of a little bitty incision, I had to, you know, get the big right across my neck, big Big incision, big surgery. And you know, when I was getting ready to go and to find out the test results, and I'm going through these tests, I am so thankful for people who prayed, and I'm thankful for people that had big faith, expectant faith. And they said, ah, it's going to be nothing. You know, those things happen sometimes. And you know, if we go, and if I were to go on and had it, removed because it had to come out, as the doctor said, either way, it just had to come out. And it would have been nothing. We would have been, yeah, praise God, look at God work. But that wasn't the answer. So the thing is, do I praise God in that moment because he 
is God? Or do I praise him for my benefit? Do I praise him because I got the good result? Well, I didn't get the good result. Did God somehow step off the throne? Did he go to sleep? Is he on vacation? Is he no longer holy? Is he no longer powerful? Is Jesus Christ no longer at the right hand of the throne of God, mediating on my behalf? Is he, by his stripes we are healed? Well, they went away. I'm not going to be healed. No. No. God is still on the throne. Christ is still there. And we praise God because he is God. You see, when we make that commitment and then we get the bad diagnosis, when we have a loved one die, when we lose a job, when we have children that we keep praying for them to return to the Lord and they don't, do we praise God because... He is God. We so often want to get out of the difficulty, but we should praise him in the difficulty. We have talked about Nehemiah praying to God and having a focus on God. And we have talked with ourselves about having a focus on Christ in our daily walk and setting aside our sin. But when God works in a mighty way, we should praise God. We praise him because he's God, but then when he works, we need to be thankful for what he has done, as Nehemiah and the Israelites were. But when God does a great thing in our life, so we talked of that negative of the hard times, and we praise God because he's God. But when he does a great thing, and when he blesses us in some way, we praise God because he's God. It keeps us from pride. It keeps us from inserting ourselves into the equation of success. When we praise God for what he has done and because he is God, it keeps us from ownership. What we have is not ours. It is God's. Our time, talents, and treasures, it's all God's. He gave it to us to be good stewards. For what he gives, we should praise him because he is God. Verse 43 says that they made sacrifices, great sacrifices, and God made them rejoice with great joy. For these chosen people of God and the priests, they would understand this purifying themselves in the wall. They would understand the great sacrifices that needed to be made. For these were all a part of the Levitical law of the Old Covenant. And it was, as we saw last week, as the people celebrated with feasts. These were great times of celebration because they were back in their homeland. They were returned from exile. And now this purification ritual, this making of great sacrifices, would have been all a part of the law that God had given Moses and Moses had given the people. The Israelites would know and understand that to truly praise God, there would need to be a time of purification, and this comes with sacrifices to God. You know, if you're here today, and you're thinking, yeah, I heard that first part, praise God because he's God. But you don't understand there, preacher. Right now, I did get the bad news. Right now, life is a struggle. I don't know about praising God. Well, if it's a struggle for you and you feel there's no reason to praise God, then let me tell you, we praise God because he's God But we can also praise God because we no longer need to sit there and sprinkle things on the wall and bring in sacrifices of animals because we are no longer under the old covenant. We're no longer under the Levitical law. 
We could praise God because, as we just sang, victory in Jesus and at the cross, we are set free from that bondage of sin. We are set free to the new covenant. And Hebrews 9 says this, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Christ, it is in him the ultimate sacrifice. If you know Christ is your Savior, just as we can praise God because he is God, we can praise God because we know the Savior and have salvation in Jesus Christ. And That chapter goes on in verse 15. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. We could praise God because he is God. We could praise God because there is a new covenant in Jesus Christ. We are set free. We are no longer under that bondage. And if that is not something to praise God for, then I don't know what else we would see. We need to praise God because we know a Savior. And verse 43 says, God made them rejoice with great joy. People praise God And he gave them joy. When we praise God, he gives us joy. We praise God because he is God. And when we praise God, he gives us joy. We see this expression of God's joy in the people of God in several places. But just a few is Ezra. Where Ezra, remember, we've mentioned this before, in Ezra, in the book of Ezra, the people had returned. There's three waves of people returning. And it was first Zerubbabel, and and then it was Ezra. And we see this dedication of the temple. And at that time, in Ezra 6.22, it says, And they kept the feast of the unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria to them so that he aided them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. They were celebrating just as Nehemiah and the people were celebrating going around the wall. They were celebrating and that God gave them joy. Psalm 126 says this is a praise psalm of of when they returned from captivity. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion... We were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they, sang, then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. They celebrated and praised God with gladness and thanksgiving. First Peter 1, 8 and 9 for us in Christ, it says, though you, may, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. When we praise God, we have joy. We should praise God because he's God. And when we praise God, we have joy. And praising God with gladness and thanksgiving is a testimony to the lost and unbelieving world. Praising God is a testimony. At the end of this passage, the very last sentence, I think, is great. It says, In the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. We don't know the distance, 
but it was heard far away. Again, if you can imagine, the people got up on the wall, and they were going around the wall as choirs. But there were other people. This was the, the priest and the singers and Ezra and Nehemiah. But in the city, there were people. The church, today, we are made up of different people. And they were the people that were, could be a part of the, that were a part of the house of God, a part of the people of God. And they were there walking around, and they were in the city, but the other people were up on the wall. And it says, and it includes even the women and children also rejoiced. The reason that's included, it's saying everyone was there. And they were shouting and praising God and thanking God for what he had done. You see, praising God is a testimony. Remember at the beginning, right from the very beginning in Nehemiah 1, we see the enemy show up. And they start with this ridicule. And you see them throughout the book. And remember, they're up on the wall. A lot of people. If you want to turn there, you can. But in Nehemiah 4, in Nehemiah 4, remember we had seen these characters at the beginning and says about Sanballat and how he was, they were angry because the Jews were going to do something good. They were angry that Nehemiah wanted to do something good for the Jews. And then, remember Tobiah? Tobiah the Ammonite, the enemy. And he was beside Sinballat, and he said, Yes, what are they building? If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Remember, a fox, a light little fox, is going to break down their wall. Now, they have two choirs of people walking on the wall, praising God, being loud, noise, and it's heard far away. When God does something great, we need to praise him. We need to give him the honor, him the credit. They were walking on the wall. They were praising God, and God had done a mighty work. Can you imagine the enemy now? They see this power of God, and the people are praising him for it. We need to praise God at all times and for what he has done. We need to praise God because he is God. When we praise God, he gives us joy. And when we praise God, it's a testimony to the lost and unbelieving world. You know, I remember a time of praising God that I've never been able to see again, and it may not, until I'm in heaven with the Lord. But I remember, some of you men may have been a part of this, but I remember in 1985, 1995, excuse me, 1995, in May of 1995, there was a movement of men at that time in the 90s called Promise Keepers. Some of you may have been a part of it, some of you may have gone to conferences. But I remember in May of 1995, I went with a group, and there were almost 100% of them were military men, Coasties, Coast Guard, because I was in the Coast Guard. There was a, some Navy, a um, couple of Marines, I believe. Sorry, you Army guys. I don't know if there was any Army. But there were probably other Army guys there, but in our group. And at this Coast Guard base I was stationed at, the chaplain there, great man of God, and he had started several Bible studies, Promise Keeper Bible studies, small groups. And we went to what is no longer the stadium they use in Washington, D.C., but it was RFK Stadium at that time. And I still remember going there. 
didn't know what to expect. You know, you're going to have a bunch of worship services, people are going to sing, going to have some speakers, it's going to be all men. And I go there, and I still remember uh, we were fortunate to have seats on the field, and they had chairs all set up on the field, and then you had people sitting in the stadium. We were about probably in the middle, ways back, so it was a great seats. We weren't right up, but we were in good position. And I'll never forget men praising God. Now, I told you about my father praising the Lord. He praised the Lord in all situations, different times of good and bad. But my father and my mother couldn't sing a note if it was right in front of them on key. And neither can I. But I know how to worship the Lord. And I know we need to praise God because he is God. And I remember standing there, and I still can picture it. And I was standing there, and people were probably like, look, what's wrong with me? Why am I not worshiping the Lord? But I was worshiping the Lord. Because I did at one point when we were singing, and I did a slow, very slow, 360. And I turned around, and I looked and I looked at these men, and I get goosebumps right now. They were all up there, all around the stadium. And they were praising God. And there were so many men that came to know the Lord at that conference. And that time of praising God, it was a testimony. And the reason I know it was a testimony because I was with people, their lives were changed, my life was impacted. But the reason I know is because as I was preparing for this sermon, I used the good old Google and I looked this up. And I knew it was sometime in that time frame, but I couldn't even remember the exact year or month. And I found there's an article, probably numerous ones, but I found one in particular. And it talks about that particular Promise Keepers conference at RFK Stadium in May 28, 1995 is the article. And it speaks to what God did there. It's a secular news article. But it speaks of the men coming together to worship God. People were praising God for who God is. They were praising God because he sent his son Jesus Christ as Savior into the world. And they were praising God and it became a testimony. When we praise God, because he is God, when we praise God, he gives us joy. And when we praise God, it's a testimony to the loss. Because we're saying God is God and he is the one in control. As I close, I challenge you and encourage you to praise God in all situations at all times. And I challenge you as we sing. I was doing it earlier, some good songs. And I challenge you as, you sing, as we sing to praise the Lord. Psalm 150, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, ladies, sing loud. Men, there was one thing in the article, and I remember it, and there were people there, they had a lot of different shirts. It said, a real man, you know, loves God. A real man prays with his family. There were a lot of different ones. But another one was, a real man sings real loud. So let's praise God, because he is God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we see Nehemiah and the Israelites 
they look again to you. They remember you. Nehemiah has remembered you in prayer. He has remembered you saying you are the one that will do it. He has remembered you in bringing Ezra to read from the book of the law. He has remembered you throughout this book as we see he did. And he remembered you as he brought a time of celebration, a time of praising God. Lord, help us as we sing now to praise you, to sing loud, to praise you, God. There are times for contemplation. There are times for quiet. And there are times to praise you. Lord, help us to always remember to praise you because you are God. In the good and the bad, you are still God. You tell us we will have struggles, and you are still God. Lord, help us to praise you. Help us to praise you when you bless us so that it gives you the ownership. It gives you the credit of the work. And Lord, in praising you, we will have joy and in praising you, we will be a testimony to the lost world. And we thank you for this as we do continue in praise. We pray this all in your precious name. Amen.